take a minute. This came from Don Dixon and the ground crew. And they sent a real nice note from, from Don, Mike, Zuriel, and the guys. And addressed a letter to Peeps. Anyway, everybody knows I love British warplanes. I think as a whole they comprise one of the most attractive groups of airplanes to model. And this is an exceptional book. Now, I had never seen this one yet. This is just loaded, just loaded with things that I've never even seen. But the main thing is it's a, it's a, a source for ideas for new planes, and because we're always looking for new ideas. It is one of the really good ones, and it's got some of the oddities of the Spitfire. Now, I just browsed through this today. Some of the oddities of, uh, oh, actually, of the Sea Fire. One of the things that uh, well, I was doing the Sea Fire, some information I hadn't, I hadn't even known about. But that's the whole point: is you always learn. And that, by the way, P51. You know, a lot of people don't realize England had a lot of P51s. Anyway, Don, you've outdone yourself, Zuriel, all you guys. I have to tell you. There's, to me, there's no substitute, and I know there's, there's got to be typhoons in here. Plenty of ideas for doing our, there's some hurricanes, another nice subject. You never have too many books. You never have too many ideas. A lot of people linger along, and they just never, they never get an idea of what they want to do. They're always in limbo. Well, it doesn't hurt to have a few books on hand. Always, a, I think, always a good investment. One of my favorites, Steve DeJulius, The Mosquito, Aronstein. Just some, just some absolutely unbelievable nice stuff. Some of the P-40s, that makes a, uh, Kitty Hawks make an excellent stunt model. Several people have done that already. You just, and the more I look through it, I mean, this is the kind of book you look through it, then you go back, look through it, you go back, look through it. A lot of good stuff. We do Spitfire paint jobs. Just amazing. Just amazing what a good book this has done. Got to thank you guys a lot. Of course, the Typhoon. And this will be real good, actually, for painting ideas, ink lines, whatever. You never have too many Typhoons, that's for sure. Thanks a lot. What? General Champ wants to know, why can't you build a light tail? Now look at this. Champ built one. <laughs> it pauses. Yeah, like, like when you throw it up, it, it takes a break. Let me see how much it really weighs. The scale doesn't lie. Gerald, I'm telling you, this guy, you got to watch out for him. Wow, you really did a good job on this. I didn't know you were this good. Yeah, uh, eyeball down the edge. To see how straight it is, besides being light. It's a little over an ounce. It's an ounce and three grams. Oh. That's well, not I really as good. it that much. You should have hollowed the tips. I, I, I got carried away. I just got carried away and glued it's them 30, It's 30 grams. Nice and straight. Oh, jeez. It couldn't be straighter. <laughs> couldn't be straighter. <laughs> oh, my God. That looks good, Mike. I'm telling you. You're learning your stuff. One lesson. Yeah. Let's see the fusey. The fusey. You need a hand lift in that? Yeah, he's going to need a hand. Fuse came good. Yeah, that looks nice. Nice crutch. Got the wood between the mounts. Well, you this built is it. right. Yeah, I know. You built the crutch on I did this. That's good. This is the right way to do it. I knocked off the extra that I didn't need. Okay, front. yeah. You should have bent this up in the front. That'd save you some... Well, uh, you're going to carve into the mounts well, anyway. the way this technology is, you do it the other way, but... I'm getting, oh, yeah. Bobby Hunt's making me some of those formers. Okay, right. You can put so the bend in. So that you put the bend in when you, when right. you laminate. Right. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be good. We're in Fat City. Let's see, what is this, the plans to the point? Yeah, where we got to, we got a, we, uh, we got a, whatchamacallit, we Okay. Fiberglass wheel pants will be on there. Yeah, nice. Yeah. This is nice. Why don't you put the bell crank in backwards? I wouldn't. Put, I would put it in backwards. You don't need to look at the fuse. Dude. I'm telling you, just put a piece of 30 second wood 
This is the Miss Ashley plug. Yeah. Put a piece of 30 second wood on top of this and then put your piece on top. Yeah. It's a done deal. That'll fit right on there. That's the objective of all the molds. Look how close that mold is. It's not, it's not out by a sixteenth of an inch. No, this is so close. You don't even have to make Gerald Champ's mold. Holy Christmas, this is close. Really, Mike? Then they cost you extra. Maybe two pizza pies instead of one. <laughs> These molds rent for two pizza pies a night. <laughs> it's worth every worth every, every slice of pepperoni. Every pe I need pepperoni tonight, big time. Cool. Big train show tonight. Mike and I are going to the train show. And as we always do, first we have to figure out how to rule the world here. It ain't working out. Okay. Well, you should have no trouble making that fist. Well, I don't look like this, right? You could probably make a bottom piece too if you wanted to. Make two. The bottom's the same shape. They're all 90 uh, degree so angles. Just put a quarter piece of yeah. quarter. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. If somebody's building a dreadnought, this will fit right on like a glove. No, nope, and Mike will make one for you, but no charge at all. One of the pipes we're making for uh, Lyle Lawson, we got to replicate this in carbon. We weighed it out. It's almost three ounces. The Jimmy's going to make a Teflon mandrel for Lyle. Lyle, of course, the pylon king. I still think you ought to ask him about that aluminum piece. Yeah, I'm going to call him. Give him a, give him a holler. So we got molding technology, we got pipe technology. All we need right now is pizza technology, and we are and train we're gonna find that. train show technology. We need. Oh, deck. Do it in two pieces, a sixteenth. Ah, yeah. You showed me the one that you and had. And put done. white glue, watered down white glue in between. Alphatic. And leave the Make Teflon sure on. Leave the Teflon. Oh yeah. The Kajeski told me. The Kajeski all about knows the, all about the it. The release problems that we. <laughs> the Kajeski release problem. You're more than a get out of jail. See if that code. fits on. Does, does that plane have a turtle deck? It, yeah. Well, it's not much. A dreadnought. Of a deck, but it's sort of. Let me see how big it is. We'll cut it down. Yeah, we'll just cut it down. We'll make it bigger. I mean, what is this? The uh, it's going to kill you if you have turtle decks of a quarter of it. I have canopy. Oh, you bought a kit, right? I have those canopies, those Randy Smith canopies, too. They came with the kit. Okay. I got extra ones the if you pinch it up. Midgley made a bunch of them for him. The kit I got from Jack and Bone. This is, this is the same thing. Same thing. Same thing. So, now there's only two possibilities. Randy copied my stuff or I copied his stuff. <laughs> or we both copied Paul Walker. I don't know. <laughs> but they're an awful lot alike when you look at them. In today's mail, some exotic photos. These are from these are from Gerald Champ, and he says these are built. I'll read the captions for each one. These are, by the way, these are look at the size of these photos. I guess he downloads these. I don't know. And he's laminated them. Gerald, you're okay, man. I'll tell you, you and Don Dixon know this stuff. See, I still don't have the opinion all photos should be. <laughs> anyway, we run through this real quick. He's got some real interesting stuff relative to the nose construction. I like. By the way, I like the carbon fiber reinforcement. That's good. It looks like he's using the constant cord elevators. Maybe. I don't know. And, of course, we all love that operation. The official cardinal canopy. That's how he made the nose break. A couple of things are significant. He didn't want to use the, the battery, have the big cutout here. But he's got plenty of air outlet here. And, of course, this will fit for the, any kind of uh, throttle. throttle. Oh, see, he's got the other throttle linkage down here interesting set of pictures now this is something i opted not to do i was afraid this piece would start doing that but my only suggestion is if if this plane isn't fiberglass the nose of this and fiberglass an extra layer around here so that joint doesn't come through to paint do both sides neat as all general stuff neat as a pin this is what video lets you do is share these ideas because this is one of the things joe and i wrestled with we wanted to be able to take the cowling off. There's several ways to do this. I changed the whole nose of the Typhoon because I wasn't happy with what originally looked like a good idea. I like the idea of the, the air outlet being here. I love to answer the phone, by the way. The phone is my friend. Here you can see what Gerald's talking about, the offset in the plug. Now notice the slot. This is Gerald's throttle control. And that's a really unique way of doing it, which I really like. All you four-stroke lovers, just check this out. This is a great idea. I like the way he did this. Like I said, uh, there's a close-up of the motor coming up. 
very, very well engineered nose. I really applaud this kind of uh, <laughs> technology. This is actually better than mine, but don't tell anybody. The cow looks like all in place in one place. That is a nasty looking nose. And then the exhaust side, really, really nice. Now you may want to consider Joe's making one of those Warren Walker and his number is in Pampa. He'll make you a header with a 90 degree bend there. Get the muffler tucked in more if you if you like it. We're making up, we're in the middle of making up some mufflers from parts that Big Art manufactured. Art can make these pipes out of aluminum. See how he uses the, the throttle control lever. And that is a great idea. That is, I, Jer, my hat's off to you. Shells on Gerald's plane. Some of them, have, I think I made some of these. Yeah, if they have the green tape, they're the ones I made. It doesn't really matter why they're so easy to make. Project, this is the last of the film. This is one of the projects Gerald's working on aggressively. A foam wing with a wrapped leading and molded leading edge. Really looking forward to seeing how this works out. This is definitely, definitely pro stunt. I like that a lot. Anyway, from Gerald's champ, we're getting back to work. to get back to our paint job here enough we've had distractions diversions work to do outside the shop but we're ready to get back to work on this paint job okay he's been sitting over there with the invasion stripes drying up everything should be dry and the next step I want to work on this I want to get one more color painted on this today the first thing I want to do is lay out where the roundels are going to go on the fuselage. This is the next step in our paint work. Okay, now the first thing I wanted to do, I want to make sure, because this has been drying a couple of days. Now the first thing I want to do is lay out where this is going to go. And I want to mask off what will be the red. Determined to make this frisket paper work. All I'm going to do, I'm going to use a compass with a razor, with a blade. These are the circles I had from the previous one. I got to cut the circle smaller. But I just, I'm really determined to try to make this work. And because this is a flat surface, this will give me a good indicator of whether this is going to be appropriate for us. All I want to do is mask off the red spot that's going to be in the middle of the roundel for right now. These real expensive compasses. I believe it or not, I found this in the drawer. <laughs> I know I had it. I think there's a Bob Martens donated this. What I want to do is bring this circle in and cut a frisket circle this size. The deal is if everything works well for us, is I need to. Hold. Here's what happens: if you light a compass over, you get a you get an ellipse. Kind of hold it up straight. I found the best the best way to do it is to tape the frisket paper down. In fact, this one. Well, I'll make several of them before I'm happy with them. I'm sure. Just that this is the devil I don't know. Okay, because it's the devil I'm getting to know. Take out the backing. Oh, I see. I didn't cut all the way through the backing here. Anyway, we're hoping we can get get some more. Oh, I see. I made an ellipse here. Anyway. Here's the deal. Never be afraid to make some ellipses or make some things you're not happy with. Because that's the way, at least I've found. Let me get some tape. That's the way you build your skills. Let's try If at first you don't succeed, try the outfield. Okay. So now I realize I have to cut through the backing paper. 
I fooled around trying to make letters and things, and just, I just, for me, it was easier to do it with the tape. And maybe I'm going to do this with tape too. But I guess the lesson here is not to be, not to be intimidated by any of this. And I'm cut on an Excel cutting pad, of course. I've been fooling around with this just to see something. It seems easier, and I don't know if this is the this is the reality of it. it seems easier to not go through the backing paper just to score, actually just score the the little piece that we're going to use. Anyway, I guess we're going to find out. Showtime. Let's see if this works. It's the devil I know. Anyway, I'm going to start to notice devil here because I want to use this in the future. And we'll see if this, what's the worst that can happen here? We'll go back and do it over. Now what I want to do is lay this down. They tell you in the instructions too, you can use the frisket over and over again. So I guess we'll find out, because it's like a very low tack. And it's made for airbrush work. Now that looks like it's going to work. See, because we're on a solid surface here, but I, I'm thinking on a uh, on a built-up wing, maybe not. Okay, so this will be the red, and I'll back mask this out with the tin foil. I guess we're going to find out when I go to remove this uh, tomorrow. The lesson here is, whenever you're using new material, you know, maybe allow for the fact it may not work the first time for you, but if you keep after it. And obviously, if it's possible that it can work, I still don't see that this has enough tack to go over an open bay wing. But we'll see if somebody in the audience that's used it before can uh, give us a little bit of a heads up on it. And since the red covers real well, I guess we'll find out. And the the. The general rule for pulling up the tape is always either 24 hours or the next day, whichever comes first, which probably means 12 hours is okay. I don't know who made that rule. I didn't. Anyway, we're going to find out. I can picture some paint jobs where this this would really be uh, an asset. Dan Banjock's paint job, for instance, that. Uh, the Miss Susie Q. We're on a voodoo with all the, uh, well, just an unbelievable amount of paintwork on a voodoo. But anyway, we'll see. Before this day's out, I'll never go hungry without frisket again. The trick that seems to work the best, and you can see I've cut up a lot of frisket, <laughs> may have to go to the store and get some more, is to set the compass and just score the frisket, holding the compass as as close to vertical as possible, and then just pulling out just the frisket in the middle, and leaving the backer. Now, see what I've done. This seems to be. I'm assuming you're making roundels. If you're making checkerboards or something else. You know, be, I'm always taping it down to a cutting pad. This is an XL cutting pad. You can get these right from John Brodeck. And if you're cutting wood on glass things or you're not using a cutting pad, save yourself a lot of wear and tear on your blades, on your nerves. Worked well. I've had this same one for quite a while. Now, what I did, I leave the backing on there. See that? I had some fingernails, I could pull this up. Maybe there's a trick to pulling it up, I don't know. There's always a trick. What am I talking about? Somebody out there is going to know exactly how to do this, or to have some instructions, or a book. A book would be the thing. You know who I bet would know? Will Nomura. Who would have pull him? And you find out somebody you know for your whole life is an expert on doing these things, and they could have saved you hundreds of hours of time. This part I haven't figured out yet. 
I guess you need to bake a little tab or something first. I guess we do it from the front. I'm trying not to put a wrinkle in it is the problem. I guess there's no substitute. It's like God gave you fingernails. There we go. This the lesson is stick with it. Be tough. Look at this. A frisket roundel. What you've been doing is putting a really thin coat of clear right on the edge, which we'll, uh, you know, we'll try to do with the frisket. Now maybe you don't need it with the frisket. When we do, uh, we're going to be doing real soon Midgley's carbon wing test plane. And we'll be trying some frisket, I guess. We just need, we're at the bottom of the learning curve with this material, but I'm hoping we're going to learn something. Now the test will be tomorrow when we go to pull that off, if we get a nice edge. In the meantime, I want to do the blue. I guess we're set up to do the blue part of the roundels here. I'm trying to do it in some logical sequence, but because the fuselage, it just isn't going to work out because we're, we're one step ahead on the wing, ahead of the body. So let me tape out, and we can't use the frisket on the wing anyway because it's silk span. Let me tape out the roundels on the wing, the blue. But, uh, believe it or not, and believe me, I'm not kidding when I say it, one of the toughest things to paint are the roundels when you do a British warbird and get them laid out in in symmetry and getting this, the shapes and the sizes and the percentages and the it's a lot of work. Again, I've tried and I'm I've, I've totally given up on putting frisket over open bays, so I'm going to have to do the whole thing with masking tape and then back mask it, of course, using this as my pattern. Now, I really wish I could find a magic bullet for that frisket and to find that maybe they would make that frisket in uh, some much tackier version, but then it would defeat the purpose of it in airbrush work. We're going to find it, though. I am going to be doing some homework in the next week or so. Trying to figure, maybe I'll even call a company up and ask them. You know, what I wanted to show is, when I get to this point, I get rid of this tail. Because as you come around, you run into this and it just knurls up. Sometimes you can get away with having this piece of tape off the roll. Sometimes you can't. Right now, I can't. And again, I've been been blessed with having what looks like a paintable day out there. I just never can tell this time of year if we're going to have paintable weather. But they're predicting a whole weekend of rain, so we're all excited. All the guys have been calling each other to go flying. Everybody wants to go flying. And we haven't been flying in about, seems like, about 20 years or so. The only one flying around here is Peeps. Now the inner circle is really a little bit more difficult than the out. Uh, look at this. And it's where the joint and the tape is usually some kind of bleed in if you don't use the clear. Now the next thing I need to do is set this end up. I know this looks easy on tape. Believe me. If these circles, if the circles are off just the, ti the tiniest bit, it looks terrible. And this, it doesn't matter. We can just leave the tail stuck down. This is the easier of the two is to do this. Now, this would be really easy to do if you had a way of putting this on a lazy Susan or something, but a lazy Wendy. Like anything, when you pick 
a British warbird, you know you're going to be painting some kind of roundels on it. Now the color we're going to be using is Insignia Blue, which covers relatively well, so we don't have to really worry. Over silver, almost everything covers in one, or at worst, two coats. And during this part of building, is the garbage can gets full of tinfoil, and for some reason, Peeps has been just going nuts. He's fallen in love with tinfoil. This is a new thing he's... See what he does? He goes down here, he checks out the tinfoil, and the next thing I know, I look and it's in his cage. Hey! He's dying to go to Brodax, too. He says I should build him a cage and take him to Brodax. Ah! Might be the only bird in the universe that has his own videotape. He didn't bring that in there. I put it in. But he loves to chew the tape up and pull it out. And a little destructive bird. You're not going to Brodax if you don't behave. Raised on a job like this, we go through three, four, five rolls of tin foil. The garbage can weighs a hundred pounds. I wonder if the garbage men think, "What the hell is he doing down there?" There's something I can use the frisket for. Let me see if I can make some a little bit undersized, and then just have to tape the edge. See, it won't matter if this doesn't stay down totally. It just won't go down the way I want it to on this, these silk span areas. I always remember that little compass pieces in the middle. Now I need to cut a bunch of little pieces and just go around the edge to seal that up. Now all we need here is the outer edge, we need the outer ring, which we take the impression right in the tin foil, and overcut that about a quarter of an inch. Gotta do this three more times. Isn't that fun? And then we'll be ready to do the roundels, the blue on the roundels. And get this edge sealed with the clear. Anyway, it looks like the weather's gonna hold, but it looks like we're gonna have a ruined weekend with the rain. Hey, but it really looks like it's the first day of spring. I can't believe it. First day of something. Believe me, the phone is ringing off the hook today. These guys want to go flying. They don't understand. We're committed to the World War II typhoon effort here. I noticed I didn't forget to put the zippering box in place. And what I always think is a good idea, if possible, is always do the bottom first. This way, if the paint's a little too thin or too thick, you can make your recovery. And then the last thing, do the W at the top of the plank. For those of us who are not perfect, we get a paint work. And what I do with the insignia blue, for some reason, it, it tends to leave zebra stripes. So what I do is I fan, put the fan on the gun adjustment as far out as I can. Always a big help if you can use the sun to your advantage. In this case, I'm trying to. I use the sun to candle. Because I don't want to get either the zebra stripes or some areas that are darker than the areas around them. You 
give some idea how that paint is laying down. That looks about right. And we'll put this in the car to dry. This has been an excellent way to keep some of the odor out of the house. And yet you can see this, the wind star is in the sun. So what happens is once I shut that, it becomes like a little cooking oven. And the next day I leave the windows down and in a day or so the odor is out of the van. And Cameron loves me. Now this will be the test. Everything here is the test. Let's see what kind of an edge we get with this frisket stuff. Even though this isn't totally dry, it's only been dry for about four hours, I'd like to get the blue on this today because if I can, what it's going to allow me to do is Okay, nice edge. Nice phone call. Success. I made up a little frisket circle to see if I could use that for the inner taping since I've had good luck with that. Now let's see it. The thing I want to see is this paint's only four hours old if it's going to pull that paint up. Let's see if this side... Now one of the things... See, one of the things i got to be really aware of is i got to get this centered. And I can, you can do it by eye. But if you really want to be, uh, you know... You can put a sheet of Teflon under there and just slide it out. See, it doesn't have, This stuff has a funny kind of attack. It tacks, but it... That looks pretty good. Now I gotta cut the outer circle and then back mask it. This will be a good test. This will be an interesting test to see if we're gonna get these nice edges and not pull up the paint that's four hours old. Now I guess half of the, the trick here was to get this just to get the circles the right size. found there's a good way to pull the, uh, the frisket up is just put a little piece of tape on it. But see, this is the problem when a thing is, it's got to be really centered. And I don't know that that we have to lay the, the template down. Not sure yet. But I know if these circles are off a little bit, yeah, this is going to be difficult. Well, let's give it another way to do it. Let's put the template on. Where's that thing? Imagine trying to build a model without tape. Anyway, we have this great window of opportunity with the weather. Wow, it's like it's like Anaheim out there. I just can't believe it. Okay, let's see if this works better. Now that looked like it was okay, but I'm going to make sure the edge is down. But when you're locked up in a house all winter and you get a day like today, and all your buddies go flying. Now I don't know if this is going to make an impression that we can use. Let's find out. It certainly does. I was wrong. Not as great. So it is. We're learning a little bit about frisket paper. And we're trying to segment out the uses where it is appropriate. And you know, so far, the, the real hang-up is it doesn't want to go over open bays where there's a bend. And I'll bet there's a trick, like you heat it, or you kiss it, or hug it, or put it in Peach's cage for an hour. Anyway, when I'm kind of pushing this on, because I want to get this painted today. Yeah, right, let's see how that works. Just an incredible introduction to spring here. It is just... I can't tell you what a day this is. Holy mackerel. This is why people move to Jersey, for the good weather. Okay, let's test this little puppy out. I'm trying to candle it. Now 
one thing I will admit, there's an advantage to the frisket, a big advantage, in the fact that you can see through it. So it could be that we're going to learn. Never underestimate the power of something waiting to learn. Or actually for anybody to learn. I found, it, and it is important, I found with this color blue, this insignia was better to dust dust on two light coats. I don't know why, it's it probably, probably it's a very translucent color. And I just assumed the insignia blue wouldn't even need to be decanted, but maybe it does. I'm not sure. But it dries in about 30 seconds in this weather. Anaheim, I love it. It's like going for a motorcycle ride this afternoon. Just put all these cool pipes and everything on the back burner and, and head out. That's what they do in California. They don't, you know, like something happens and, oh, huh, just get on my Harley and, you know, in Jersey you work to pay the taxes. Anyway, we'll see how that, we'll see a laugh about it. We'll see how that looks when it dries up. Insignia blue. Better two light coats than one heavy one. Or decant the heck out of it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why that is. It really hurts. Mike Estella just called me on his cell phone to tell me virtually everybody's up the field. Everybody but Wendy. Ugh. Even Jackabone's out flying. Can't believe it. Anyway, this is going to dry. We have some other... Unrelated to the world of stunt projects, we're making some tune pipes for Lyle Larson. And Jimmy is supposed to come up here, we're going to work on the molds. It's such a nice day, one of the things I thought might be good is, I got my 91 all fitted up with the header from Warren Walker. This is the 90 degree, in other words, I just brought this the 72 out for comparison. This, this angle's way out, if you look down from the top. And I wanted to see if this header here, it tucks into the, tucks the muffler in better. And I also have, and Bob Zambelli's working on a companion piece, a piece with the threads that we're making another muffler for. So what I thought would be good because it's such a nice day, uh, this one's, I want to spend the time with the 91. Now the things I want to be checking are, because I've moved that to how I have the carburetor and everything offset, I want to see how that's going to work. I want to see what kind of power and RPM it's going to pull on that prop. I want to see what, if any, is going to be the, the cost and RPM of the rubber stinger. And then I, if I do have time, I want to try the, the muffler off Tradition 72. Try that muffler on here because that muffler is a little smaller. So we'll find out. First step, laying the engine. We just let it run out. This is a 32 ounce tank. We let it run out a 32 ounce tank, under 4,000 RPM. That takes a couple hours, an hour or so. So we adjust the throttle. We have it set so we can adjust the throttle here. Just like to leave it rich. At least the first tank of fuel. I don't want to take any chances on having a problem. Before we try any RPM comparison or muscle comparisons or anything, the thing we want to do is get that first quarter so of fuel through the engine. Now from the factory, the carburetor is usually adjusted rich. You can see if you, if you pull it, you can shut the engine off. That's on the rich side. And when you see that much smoke, you know it's rich, so we can go in a little bit at a time.
official indication is that's the prop that we use to compare engines, which usually about 9,000 is good. This boat is going up near 11 on its first hour of running. It's about nine, six, nine, seven on the other motors. Over eleven thousand, and it's not even fully broken in. So this is just going to be a killer on power. is telling me is this motor is far, far more powerful in the 72, the 56 or the 70. It's in a league of its own power-wise. I want to tell you how pleasant it is to break these engines down. My neighbor is sitting in her lawn chair over there. I don't even think she knows the engine's running. It's getting cold out here though, but it's a good day to break any engine. I'll get a second tank full on it and then just start doing my muffler testing. There's nothing better than a good cup of coffee when you're breaking any engine. What's significant is just how many RPM this engine is pulling. I mean, what typically happens is after a, another hour run, I'll pick up a couple hundred more RPM. This motor is going to be an absolute killer. Now, once you have about an hour on the engines, they start to clean up. And I can typically go in about an eighth of a turn on that on the low end adjustment. Still just a feels a tad red. You need these little tiny screwdrivers you can buy at Home Depot to get that screw and drill it in there. Now, I don't know how you figure the numbers, but if you go from 9,600 to 11,000, the power increase has to be like a 50% increase. Now, like somebody like Netsband would know that. It's a tremendous, tremendous increase over a 72. That is some tremendous horsepower. And this is the muffler that comes with the engine. We have Big Art making us some muffler parts. Some other people have Midley has volunteered to try to make up some different, less restrictive mufflers, but I don't even think you need them. new dimension of interest for me in modeling. Oh, I just, I 
but nonetheless. I wanted to run this without the pressure fitting attached, so I had a cap on that before I guess it flew off. Because what was happening, it was putting the burnt oil back into the fuel. And it runs fine, no pressure, seems to, seems to be very uncritical. It has about two, it has not quite two turns of needle before it starts going lean and rich, so it's plenty wide range. And I was nervous about the carburetor being off to one side. Seems like it's no big deal at all. I'll be real curious what the mileage is. Maybe before the day's out, I'll run a tank of a Joe Adamusco tank and just see how long it'll run on a tank of fuel. But it won't really be a relative number, not at this point. Now there's another point. Even if you're going to run a Venturi on a four-stroke, you want to break it in with the throttle. You definitely want to have be able to run it slow like that. Um, they recommend under 4,000 RPM for at least an hour. There's a lot of moving parts in these motors. Is really good throttle response. Like the scale guys, they want to they want to do these things in scale. Let me tell you, it doesn't get a lot better than that. What I want to do, I recorded some RPM readings. With the, this is the muffler that comes with it, and this is the header that Warren Walker bent for us. But it's a, for all purposes a stock header. And what I want to do, I want to see if there's a gain or a loss with this. By the way, the 80 comes with the same muffler, so I'm wondering. I'm wondering if, like on General Shamsey, you couldn't use this muffler if it shows an, an increase. We don't know yet. But the only way I know of to, to find this stuff out is do the test. This motor is a powerhouse. I don't know if we're going to be able to use those, but I can picture the prop that's going to ultimately wind up. Woo! Don't forget it's hot. Anyway, if you can look in here, this muffler has a, a cone baffle, so it might be that they're doing some tuning in there. I can't, I don't know if you can even see that. It's a little heavier than the 72 muffler or 80 muffler, and bigger volume. So this is probably what we're going to want is more volume we're going to learn about this. I wish I had a way of measuring what temperature this gets. It gets plenty hot. my conclusion that there really isn't a big gain or a loss in a muffler other than maybe, maybe, and I just maybe, that this one is, uh, it's because of the rubber guy too. 
and I was doing that to benefit the neighbors. We don't need, I don't need an extra 100 RPM right now, believe me. This one has a much small, I can't even hold it so hot, much smaller baffle. But so for the rest of our test, the rest of our break-in, we'll use that one. I worked out here and I guess you saw that the battery doesn't go on and off easily what I did the max F plug has a funny kind of maybe I need a grind on it or something I don't know but one of the things that worked is just putting two washers under it that seems a lot better with two so it must be that or maybe it's maybe it's just this guy here that look at that I loosened it up again it's just not correct I'm not sure the other batteries go on and off. Not sure why. Anybody have a magic solution? <coughs> oh, we could always use alligator clips. Let's get an eye opening afternoon. I don't know if we're going to be able to use this amount of power, but we certainly will have it on tap at all times. And it's getting freezing out here. I'm getting it. Let's just burn out this tank of fuel. Get back to the shop. I think this material is going to end up being what we use instead of that Dell running here. Well, it could be. Before I put this motor away, I wiped it off. The muffler had some goop on it, of course. Looking for anything that might need, uh, that this didn't, nothing needed to be tightened. All the screws were tight, and it's ready to put in the airplane. Now, and that is the most powerful motor that has, that test prop has never gone up to 11,000 until today. Sato 91. Jimmy has made these are wax mandrels similar to uh, the other ones and when Merlin show how this part goes on here this is going to be for the the world champion of pylon right now <laughs> if he isn't the world champion <laughs> he's screwed <laughs> he better be anyway we're making it in two parts and it's made to be something similar to this now what's the name of this wax material that you're using uh, wax material that we're using <laughs> okay it's not a candle is what I'm saying it's machinable wax. Machinable like wax, okay. And of course we're doing it in two parts. We really don't have to, only the fact that what we want to do is if this becomes the pipe. This is for Lyle Larson, by the way, my good buddy. You've seen him on the Nats videos. And he's got me doing a lot of a, this pipe work for him now. So what, what we want to try to do, if this works, is make a rubber mold for these parts so we can make several pieces of tooling because we're going to want to make more than one pipe a day once we go into production. And this, for this, this hooks onto the back of a Nelson. These are going to have to be machined individually or... You know what I wish? I wish we could make one of these up. I could make one of these out of cork, but it's going to melt. That's the problem. These are not going to... Let me get the phone. Those are not... Those got to be made out of aluminum. Roll it up, baby. Okay, these spent the night in the oven. They're post-cured. I was very curious to see. Now, because this is a wax, well, I'll grind some of this away. I'm going to try to save the mandrel for a while. In fact, I can see that this is going to see it by spinning it. I know I could punch that out now. Because you don't need any wax or any mold release, of course. 
The way this laid, and because this is a resin that's different than what we're normally using, this is Cotronics resin, when you heat it, it tends to get thinner. I also wrap because this doesn't make a nice, um, it's very important for a while that he has this long stinger and I'm not sure why he has to do something back here, but this kind of looks like it wouldn't fit the mold of the pipe without some wrinkling going on, so I put some toe in there. Now what I'm going to do next is sand this down just gradually, and then once I assemble a pipe, this is the front piece, and I can feel it, that part is loose. It may be that I can just carefully cut this and drop that mandrel out in one piece, because I just put a rubber band on there to hold the toe in place. The toe makes that a lot stronger. This is a double wall pipe. What we're looking for more than anything else is not so much the lightweight, but that it's incredibly strong. So this is the first day of work that goes into it, is getting it to this stage. Trimming this with scissors. So one of the things we expect to get from this is we want to use this wax. It's, it's machinable wax. And we're looking to get familiar with the characteristics of this, because I can picture other parts we could make with machinable wax. For instance, one thing you could do is make a whole gas tank and you could make it in one, almost one or two pieces and just melt the wax out. Each one, you wouldn't need to have a mold for every one carved out of aluminum. This stuff, supposedly, you can see, nothing sticks to it, so that's real nice. And the finish inside is real nice, too. This is the only part that bothers me, is this back part right now, that I'm going to have to do a lot of hand finishing here before I draw the second coat over. And, of course, the tape will just grind right off. Now, the front piece, and I will send Lyle a copy of this tape so he can see what we're doing in the shop. So he's been so good in sharing information with us. Anyway, that's loose already in there. So what I need to do again is with a Dremel tool, just really carefully trim that. And I will have saved all the machining operations. Now the advantage of this is once we know that we can make this, now I can take this part and with molding rubber make four, five, six of these just by pouring this machinable wax into the mold, and I can make five a day. So I can go into mold, and that's where you can cut the cost down. You can't cut the cost. Doing one a day, you lose your shirt. Doing something like this, I'm making about a dollar an hour here. But if I can make this up that I can make five a day, then we can pay the electric bill in the shop anyway. We'll pay for uh, Karen's next doll, or, or maybe I can get into pylon racing with the big guys, and in about 40 years, I'll be uh, a beginner. Anyway, I got to grind, again, this is from laying this on a sheet of Teflon in the oven, and that just grinds away, but I have to be careful not to, not to penetrate that carbon part. And this was that piece that Jimmy machined up. This would have to be machined up from every piece. But what there is, if this, see what we're trying to do is test this resin. This is a 500 degree resin. If this doesn't deteriorate or melt up here, well, then, we have, then maybe we'll make a, a rubber mold out of this and try to make one out of carbon. Again, we're going to see, but I don't have a lot of content. The pipe really gets hot here. I'm sure it's over 500 degrees right here. Now, you might be thinking, what, do, what does making pylon racing pipes have to do with your fuel line spun? It has everything in the world to do. Because as you learn about, not only learn about, but learn how to use new material, you've opened up the door to making a lot of new products. And it's, anytime you can invent something, you don't have to use it right now. You want to have it in your, in your little inventory of things for the future. Now let me just see, I don't want to force this out. I have to trim a little bit more out of there, it looks like. Just a little bit more. See, that's loose in there now. I'm going to have to get in there and trim that just a little bit more because I don't want to hurt the mandrel. Jimmy put a lot of hours into the mandrel. Get this little ring off, and that's all it took. I'm sure this will come right out. Well, maybe not. Maybe there's one little piece in there. But now, Jimmy, we because we're using a different resin than we normally use, I had to estimate the wall thickness of the original pipe because this gets made in several stages. First off, the, ins the inside of this is extremely smooth. Now, I needed to know, where's the other piece? What I need to know is if we've estimated the closure angle right, and it doesn't look like we have. Well, maybe we have. I need to know, these are going to plug together, or I have to figure, oh, I got the big drip of resin on I'll have to grind that over first. I need to be able to, 
Oh, I see, I'm, I'm measuring against the wrong thing here. I need to be able to get a nice slip joint in here. Now, one of the things this is going to allow Lyle to do is in the future to make some pipes a little bit longer and a little bit shorter to try for different power combinations. I would suspect the longer pipes are going to accelerate better and the shorter pipes are going to have a higher RPM. But again, like we're using at 90, that, that 90, the, the difference with the 90 and the 60 or the 72 is that extra 1,000, 1,500 RPM up top. Not only that, but it's the torque down low. It's got more torque up to the highest RPM and then more high RPM. So, and of course, this is the resin we want to use to make the four cycle exhaust systems when and if, and we may have to machine parts. We need to know if this joint, this is where having Lyle be part of our development team, and, I, and I'm sure he's the kind of guy who would share anything he learns. If this joint does not fail in pylon, there's a good chance it won't fail in stunt, it won't fail in, until we make a few, in making up a four cycle test muffler and let it run on a bench for four hours before we ever even run it on a plane. Anyway, we're going to assemble, i got to clean this all up, and we'll assemble this and put it back, and then put the second, this is going to have two layers of carbon. But see, you could not put carbon, another layer on top of this, without roughening this up. You need to get a grit surface on this, so that the epoxy bonds. But that's going to be a nice little pipe when it's done. So in the last month or so, we have the pipes for Andy Lofton, the boat pipes, and he's got a good shot at becoming um, one of the top guys. Maybe he's the top guy, I don't even know. Uh, but I know Lyle is one of the top guys in pylon, and hey, look at this. The bird approves. Lyle, in case you didn't know, this is Peeps. Peeps is our shop bird, and he, he inspects all pipes, and if they don't meet his vigorous testing criteria, his criteria on it, he has to peck away at them. Check this out. Get out of here, Peeps. Lyle, I'm going to work on this because I want to get this out to you as soon as possible. And Jimmy's making a second set of mandrels up today, so to this development that we want to work with is not only making longer and shorter pipes by having this additional lip we can go about three quarters of an inch in making these adjustments but also I've I've kind of worked out the numbers of what I think might or might not be a better pipe and because we have see this is where it's nice in, instead of cutting up a three hundred and fifty dollar bar of Teflon to make a test model we can make a test part with this with just a, just a labor just Jimmy's labor so the material is almost inconsequential. So this material is a unique thing, and I really think there's going to be a time, and I'm not sure when, how, or what, that we're going to find something to make with this. There's, there's just things that you can make with this kind of material where when you're done molding, you can melt the material out. It allows for different draft angles, different shapes, but the biggest one, I think, is going to be to, to have this in addition to Wayne's fuel tank tooling, which Jimmy's working on too. See, I've been grinding away on this to try to get this, because the next layer's got to taper right over there. But when the material's only a day old, it's very difficult to get it to grind the way I'd like it to. in mind that the rest of it I'll do by hand. I just wanted to get that big lump because that's where it was sitting on the Teflon. Now the rest of this will get sanded by hand until it's etched. Otherwise the second coat of resin is not going to go over the way it should. It won't bond properly. This is the part that's really time consuming is the hand sanding. Because if you try to do it with a machine what happens is you get You've got to find, as soon as you start breaking through, you've got to stop. And the part at this point in time is like an eggshell. It's very delicate. So it's a lot of hand labor, a lot of hand sanding, sometimes as much as an hour. But when it's done, you get that really good bond. And I mean, these parts are going on airplanes that we hope, you know, they're going to be world champions. These are not for sport flyers. They're not for guys that are quivering and quabbering about having to buy a $3 part. These, they want world-class stuff. They want it to be perfect. Now, this is one of the things. It's a real precision fit. I mean, this is a part that when you're making, making parts, this re-estimated 
the original thickness of the wall to be 20 thousandths and it came out to be 21 and a half. So I had to do a little bit of grinding, a little bit of sanding along the lip. But what this gives us, when you have this, this precision of a fit, now what I'm going to do, of course, is when I lay up the resin, the next step on this, I'm going to mix up some resin, cut another piece of sock, paint this, paint in here, and of course that all has to be roughed up. This will get fit back into position. And we'll pull the second layer right from the front, right to the back, and rewrap the back. And that'll be, well, see, we can, I may have to take a little bit more off there, but I wanted that nice, tight fit. The most important thing is to get the resin stirred. Get This is one of the critical things of using this resin, is to make sure, even after you think it's totally ready, it needs another two minutes of stirring. I got the material ready. First thing I want to do is make the joint. See, a lot of people don't, don't understand about, when you find, let's pretend balsa wood was one of the materials. So if you had a way of making a prototype, anything out of balsa wood, and all of a sudden it dawned on you, wow, I could use that to make model airplanes. See, you got to get familiar with new materials. You got to find out, like that mat, that wax is one of them. I'm not sure how it's going to, the material that's going into the tune pipe. Somebody had to come up with this, or we'd have no tune pipes, or we'd have no fuel tanks, or props, the prop resin. <clears throat> one of the things I've always enjoyed, or liked about my business, and I've been in business 15 years, what I've enjoyed the most is finding jobs kind of that nobody else wants to do. Years ago, nobody else wanted to make belt cranks and handles and horns. Find a job that nobody else wants to do and do it. And I always thought that would be a good way to have yeah, some job security because not many people want to do this kind of work. First off, it's filthy, dirty work. You really shouldn't be breathing any of this dust in. And when I'm not shooting video, believe me, the Wilson mask is on. But making tune pipes is a job very few people want to have their, their shop glommed up with resin all the time. Or that dust and dirt on your hands or the itching. But when you find a job that nobody else wants to do and you're willing to do it, you'll probably have a pretty good business. Now this was a this was a really important thing to get this fit just nice. Because I want to have a good overlap joint here. And I thought by sharing this, because I know Lyle is one of the people that when we were at the Nats, he was just super. I have to say that he just and everybody I've asked about Lyle Larson, they said he's a guy from the trenches. And I kind of consider myself a guy from the trenches. I don't know what the trenches are, I'll tell you the truth. Anyway, now that now it's this kind of stuff that it really gets messy. It gets dirty. It's definitely toxic and it's definitely smelly. But but the reward is when you're done with this part, there aren't hundreds of people on the world that in the world that can make these parts. And I always get a kick. I, I don't maybe I should have been an inventor in my real life or something. I don't know. Should have invented refrigerators or the internet or something that I could make some money on. But this is challenging stuff. And we got a couple new tricks we're gonna try with this that we've never tried before. I have some Teflon tape that Dave Midgley sent down. And Dave Midgley has been a giant part of this right from the beginning. He certainly contributes all of the Teflon products that you see in our shop. And the expertise of using them, even more important. Now the sock has to go over here. And the idea is not to pull off all the resin when you do this, because this is a double wall pipe. Again, we're not looking to make cheap trolley parts here. This is not for pep boys. Look at this, these scissors are still, I always unglue the scissors, whoops. New pair of scissors, <laughs> coming right up. Thank God we have friends that donate scissors to the cause. Actually these, you can just break these apart later, you heat it and they come apart. You don't throw them away. Okay, I'm being real careful to get this, and I can see the resin saturating through already, but that's not enough, we're gonna get this. Now the people at Racing Pylon, they put a lot of 
stress on these parts. And again, the strength is the number one thing here. It's not as critical as it is in stunt that they be super, super light or anything, but they must be strong. And I've never in my whole life seen a double wall pipe break, so if Lyle breaks one, Lyle, you'll be the first. And every time we use this resin, we're getting more and more familiar with it. We have about 150 degrees more than the old resin, the resin that stunt pipes are made out of. And the reason they make stunt pipes out of the inexpensive resin is it's cheaper resin, it's easier to handle. This is, this is really a smelly, I, you can't smell the smell in here, but I have fans blowing. I always have the doors open. Just can't take any chance that you're going to OD on this stuff. And I try to work quickly. As soon as summer breaks, we'll be doing all this kind of work out in the garage. We're going to set up a molding shop in the garage, hopefully, so we don't have to uh, get the smell and the mess in the house. You now we can keep inside the house for um, our other projects. Okay, now we got about a 10 minute window here that I want to keep pressing that resin down into the pipe. And I'll do a lot of this off camera because it just gets redundant, but you can get the idea. Because I know the people like Larry Cunningham and other people that are doing molding. Kim Doherty's making up carbon we're trying to make carbon waste. And, and the fact that we're all sharing information guarantees it's going to work at some point in time. If you had a bunch of little secret entities and nobody willing to share, if you're doing this back end, this is point, you just, just do this for 10 minutes and it, it kind of lays down, not really, but so I have to turn the camera on and off with a rag because I didn't before and it cost me $40 for a switch. I glued the switch together. It sits in our oven. We lay it up on a little bit of a, uh, I don't know, a, a fixture or whatever, so that the last coat of resin doesn't have any drips. And what I do is I rotisserize it about every 10 minutes. I turn it so if there's going to be a drip, it tends not to all be in one spot. Didn't have to use the Teflon tape this late because it's a little bit bigger diameter. The material conformed a little better than I thought it would. It's going to sit out here at 250 degrees for four hours. And it's done. Anyway, while Lyle's pipe is out there cooking, I get so many requests that I've had to start keeping a list. And if there's anybody you have as a favorite person and you want to see some old footage of them, you know, send me a quick note or an email. One of the people that keeps coming up over and over again that was Jim Cassell, because Jimmy used to be on all our videos and then he dropped out of the hobby. But we do have a lot of old footage of him. And I went through a lot of footage and I found what I thought was a pretty representative flight of his. He got second at the 1990 Nats with his jet style stunner called Columbia. And he is certainly one of the best flyers of all time. Uh, I would have to rank him as one of the best competitors. And, and certainly a great guy, a good guy. We flew a lot together. We had a lot of fun. And this was his flight at the 1990 Nats. You can see how rough the conditions are. He flew right after Paul Walker second official flight. interesting part of this flight. I'll be looking at Whiteley's car for seven minutes. Okay, Jimmy, do your thing, kid.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed that old footage of Jim Casal. I certainly uh, wish Jimmy would make a return to the event, and anytime I see him, I suggest that. But like all of us, time is limited. But but think about it for a minute. Isn't it great that we have some video? Now imagine if nobody ever took a video of Jimmy flying or Paul Walker or, or any of these guys. Well, you know what? Years later, you'd say, oh, remember Jimmy? Yeah, nobody would remember Jimmy. Yeah, it would be less. Only the people that were actually there could actually share it. Now, what I'm very curious about is this frisket test we did. I really hope these pipes for a while are going to be uh, meet his needs. I need to learn more about the pylon event, that's for sure. Now, I see something different. This frisket paper doesn't want to come up as easily as the original paper. And I, I suspect what happened is it's the opposite as, since I don't need this, I can sacrifice this now. It's the opposite of masking tape. This, um, we had it up by the heating vent overnight, and it gets more sticky with heat. See, that's a significant thing to learn. Talk about new materials. So the trick is if we're going to use frisket paper, don't put it up by the heat. Let's see if we can get this off without... As soon as I have something I can sacrifice, I'll try heating this with a hairdryer, but... See, in this case, it may make this even worse to take off. I don't know. The wing, I can take this stuff off, because we need to do the yellow on around L's. Today's objective is yellow on around L's, finish Lyle's pipe. Hey, well, it looks like the, the reality here is this leaves a real nice edge, possibly a nicer edge than the masking tape, but again, I haven't figured a way of making it go over... Uh, well, you know, I just thought of something. Now, see, these are the things I need to think of. Maybe by heating it, yeah, this left a lot of a lot of glue on there, so we'll get that up with some M600. This is another tip. Sickens M600 takes the glue off. Here's the problem. If you just wipe the whole thing, some of the red, I'm afraid, might run onto the white, and then once you have that pink, it's really hard to get rid of it. So I'm going to do this with Q-tip. just to try to get this up without going over onto the white. And then the glue that's on the white, I can just wipe up. Just trying to figure. They, that's the stuff I have to learn before we can either help, really help other people. We gotta find all these little pitfalls. See, here's a little bit of a problem I ran into. I want to show this on the close-up, but I used the centered around bells. I used a piece of that frisket paper. Then when I hang, I took it out of the van, hung it up to dry overnight, because of course it goes below freezing at night, or it gets colder anyway. And this looks like it really stuck down, so I guess the tip here is don't put frisket paper by the heating vent, which uh, I guess we're going to find out. The glues are a funny thing that they use on these adhesives, and you never know if they're going to get better with heat or if they're going to get worse. Boy, I hope this comes up. This is this is really getting touch and go with this. It leaves almost all the glue on the on the surface. Yeah, frisket paper to the rescue here. Let me show this up close. Yeah, as I'm pulling this up real slow, boy, am I getting nervous about this. I don't want to pull up any of that red paint. You know what? I'm going to take a chance. I normally wouldn't do this, but I want to see if the heat... Now, John Brodak gave us that great tip with the masking tape. I don't know if the frisket paper is going to be another candidate for the heat, because it's obvious to me that the heat is what... Yeah, the heat releases it. Okay, so we've learned a little bit more about it. Both tape... I guess they use a similar glue. Just low heat on a heat gun, but boy, look at all the residue it leaves on that. Oh. My round bells! Okay, so we're not gonna, I'm basically at this point in time gonna stop using frisket paper until I learn more about it. Yeah, that's, now the M600 luckily will take it off, but I wanna get it off without making the white pink, and if you do it and just wash it, some of that red will wind up on the white. Funny story, when I was working at Ford Motor Company, I made this plane called the Blue Angel, kind of a Larry Scarinzi ripoff. 
and I got to the day of doing the tape, I got all the tape on a plane, painted the yellow trim, the Blue Angel scheme, and my boss called me from work, and of course I was under the gun to come to work, and it turned out that I had to work basically about 30 hours in a row without a, sh a shift change. And what happened, that sat out in a cold garage. Mm -hmm. And when I pulled it up, I pulled the wood off the wing. That's how strong that tape got from sitting out in a cold garage. So I was always skeptical about leaving tape on even one second longer than I have to. I get paranoid about it because I know it can ruin, can ruin your whole life. Model airplanes is his life. Very funny that were true. with the M600, I'm afraid it gets on the white. So, so here I am, I'm trying to clean this goop off, and you can see it's like chewing gum. My wife walks down here and humiliates me, says, haven't you ever heard of Gooby Gone? Well, here it is, something she uses all the time that you buy in Home Depot. It has a pleasant lemon scent. I don't want a lemon scent, I want this stuff off my roundels. And she, she guarantees me it'll work. So she says, go ahead, do it on camera, and if it doesn't work, you can blame me. Karen, if you only knew. The truth is, it works perfectly. Gooby Gone takes off frisket paper residue. Better than M600. And once again, I owe my success to the woman I love so dearly. That is one little spot up here that isn't coming off, Karen. I guess this is where I cooked it. <laughs> anyway. But you can see, it does take some of the paint off, so you got to really be careful. And the one thing to never do when you get into this situation is use sandpaper. Sandpaper is just terrible. Now, Karen, i got to tell you the truth. The M600 and this, it's a tie. I can't tell it. It should be mad at me. Anyway, this is a significant thing. You go masking up a whole plane with this frisket stuff, and if they put it up, or I guess in Florida, you put it out in the sun, and the plane turns to flypaper. Once again, even with Gooby Gone, Karen, the M600 and the Gooby Gone both work. I like the M600. But believe it or not, you know what? There's still some on there. That's amazing. That frisket paper is terrible stuff, boy, when it gets hot. Don't let it get hot. I'm trying a lot of different ways of getting this frisket goo off. I flooded the area with M600, and I'm just using the end of my finger to try to get it to blow up like this. Any other way that I've tried it has really been a problem. This is really a nightmare. I, uh, you could potentially lose a plane if you've masked it all out in frisket and heated it to the point where this, it's actually hard to get this off. And if you don't heat it, the frisket, boy, it just comes right off. So boy, this is a potential time bomb you gotta watch out for here. I'm not crazy about the first bit. It's the devil I don't know. Anyway, you can see, even after all this, after 10 minutes of this, there's still some up in this corner. But the way to get it is flood it, let it sit that way, your bare finger. Just no other, no other reasonable way here that I can figure. But I'm glad I didn't mask the whole plane off with this stuff. I'm sure I've First of all, I shouldn't have put it by the heating vent. That's that's one thing. And yet the heat softens the glue. Maybe I left it on too long. It was in the cold overnight. Now, I mean, not in the cold outside. And then it was by the heat. I don't know. Anybody with any suggestions, I'm glad to share what I learned. Okay, let's hope that we let's hope we've saved somebody from having to repaint a whole model in the future. Oh, the goop is still up there. You believe this? This stuff is ten I have never seen. Now, the other wing was not up by the heating vent. It was it was down five feet. So maybe that'll come right off. I don't know. But this one was right up. This is where we hang it by the leadouts. But it shows you there's always room to learn. Especially if you're a round L. Peeps is laughing at me, by the way. He's sitting in his cage laughing. Find it that was not, it was five feet further away from the heat, and it's coming up, first off, a lot easier, and it's leaving very little residue. Yeah, some, but not a lot. So the trick is that this way we've done an accurate, and that is something that can save you an airplane. I hope that's good information for the subscribers to the videos.
I gotta tell you another funny Jimmy Casale story. Well, next thing I'm gonna do, of course, is lay out the, the yellow on the roundels. First step I'll do is outline this with eighth-inch tape. But, but let me tell you real quickly, because this is this is one of the best stories in the world of stunt. One day Jimmy had practiced up at the field, and Jimmy was a really good fanatical practice. He practiced more than I did. And he had gotten one of the ships he was working on, he just, at our field, tip weight is critical. And he had taken his tip weight and shaved it with a razor, put more in, taken some out, and he worked on this relentlessly for a whole weekend because the contest was coming up Sunday. And he came over to me right in front of about 30 people, and luckily I didn't have the camera running. And he said, Wendy, Wendy, look at this. I got this. I'll just use the razor. And I got this tip weight. Look, I took two more cuts off and it doesn't drop in the outside square. And I said, cool, Jimmy, and threw it without realizing our field, so where our field ends, it drops off and turns into a lake. I had thrown his tip weight into the lake. That is an absolutely true story. He went berserk. I said, well, tip weight, hey, take a piece of lead, you know, like I do it. I do it in quarter ounce increments. He was doing it with a razor blade, but it was funny. And, and we kind of got mad, but then Jimmy thought about it and he said, you know, if I start a fight with Wendy, you know, we both get hurt. So, <laughs> anyway. Fun. Absolutely true story. I mean, there are a million Jimmy Windy stories, Glenn Metter stories. It's it's one of the reasons I love this event. But we needed some Lyle Larson stories. Lyle, when you get to see this video, I want a Lyle Larson story. Something I can put on my video. Something funny that's happened in the world of pylon. Somebody flew into a car or something. Well, last time we were at the Nats watching Lyle Larson, Midgley got run over by a... Uh, a golf cart. Apparently the guy that drives around pylon policing the area, the safety guy or whatever he is, <laughs> he's so safe that he ran midgley over. Anyway, you see what I'm trying to do is the two-handed method of laying out the tape circles. I won't show much of this because we have so many interesting things going on in the shop here. We have projects within projects. Soon we'll have our carbon fiber tank tooling can't wait to try that. How many planes in the world are there already built that if you could knock an ounce, ounce and a quarter out of their nose, they'd fly better? And it's a lot cheaper to buy a tank, even an expensive tank, than build a new plane, that's for sure. Anyway, wow, we need some stories, man. It's the reason we do this. I actually do it for the money. I'm not interested in the people in this event. It is, and I know the thrifty among us, those who do not like to spend a dime, will love the fact you can use the centerpiece. I mean, I just buy an extra box of foil, but I know there are people who would really appreciate the fact they could use that piece, just trim it down. Anyway, we got three more of these to do, and we'd like to even get the yellow paint on this today, if possible. And then the only step left in this will be to, when all the yellow bands are done, to paint the invasion stripes and the fuselage, and we're ready to paint the plane. Go back mask, we're ready to paint the yellow, at last. Last thing we're going to do, and we'll do that tomorrow, we'll do the invasion stripes on the fuselage and these yellow leading edge bars. Now the reason I didn't want to do them at the same time, I'm doing the yellow round dolls, is I wanted to see what proportion they were going to look. I don't want to make them too wide or too thin, and I want to have all the tin foil off the plane when I lay them out. So that'll be a very small, simple operation. And finally, we're closing in on this guy. Those yellow bars really do look nice, too. I kind of like them probably figure out our little break in the weather is toast. But we want to get the yellow sprayed today. At least it's not hot. Now, relatively good coverage. Even at 20 PSI, that's covering nice. I always do the little parts first, and I'll get the wing out here, shoot the wing. 
it's uh, colder out here than I thought it was. Still better, two light coats are still better than one heavy coat. I know you're thinking this is only 10 coats at once, but it isn't. I have the gun dialed way down, and we're only at about 15 feet at a time. Well, we had that nice day running motors in. Now we got a day you could go skiing out here. Wait, next weekend, we are going to be next weekend. Next week will be May the 20th. And what I want to do is lay out, I want to pre-mix the colors that we're going to use. And check them against all the various Typhoon paint jobs. Luckily, we have plenty of color pictures of the Typhoon to match up with this. This doesn't have to be exact. I'd like it to be close, though. I don't know, after all that work, can you tell how much work we put into this wing already? Could have built a house. You know, put it in the car, let it dry, and then tonight bring it into the house. A private drying booth here. <laughs> Boy, this car is starting to stink. I have to <laughs> think it one of the room deodorizers for the car. The British Warbirds feature that leading edge stripe. That red, I always thought was painted on there. It's really a material like duct tape that covered the machine gun holes until they fired the guns and it added to the top speed of the plane. In terms of a, a stunt ship, I wanted that yellow to be as bright and as obvious as possible on a Spitfire series, and I want to do the same thing on the Typhoon. On the sea fire, I made it even wider. But what I'm going to do is go up to the Spitfire bedroom and measure all the different dimensions that I used because they seem to show up well in the air and well in the maneuvers and in the videos. Those that don't have invasion stripes, they have that, that yellow band on the front of the wing. It was very British in the, the way they finished. Even, even the models like the, the uh, Typhoon and the Hurricane. It even wraps around on a tip a little bit. We want to include that in. Even if you're making a North American Mustang, they even had it on the Mustang. Can you believe this? But anyway, that's an interesting little feature. So I want to go up to the Spitfire bedroom and I want to measure exactly what that the thickness was that we used so I can replicate it. Coming up here. Anyway, I measured this out. The original one was double three-quarter tape. This one was just a little bit wider. And this one was just a little bit thinner. So I have, I guess what I'm going to do is go with, it looks like the double three-quarter inch tape would be the most prototypical. And then I guess we'll figure it out. And these little models. Like they have the yellow band. How about this one? I don't know. There is just something about British warplanes that uh, hard to define. Hard to hard to define why I like them, but I do. trick that I do to help keep the smell down in the house when I'm working with chemicals or with br I bring the things in out of the car to dry is a Yankee candle, these scented candles. Like, first, they're nice even if you don't have any stink in the house, but they really get the smell of chemicals out of the house. That's, that's been one of the things that's allowed me to bring this stuff in at night. Well, 
Wiles pipe wound up being just a gram under two ounces, significantly lighter than the original one. And I think in some ways, well, we're going to find out from now if it's going to be usable in the world of pylon. Not today, and I'll do most of it off camera. I'm going to pull off all the masking tape. I don't want to leave any of the masking tape on any longer than I have to. I'm going to lay out those front bars, the yellow bars, lay out the invasion stripes, try to finish this up. And as I said before, that, that makes us ready to paint the airplane and put the camo and the powder blue on and whatever. And we're a day away from that. As I'm laying this, this stripe out, what I've done is laid out in a very, right on the center line leading edge, because if this is crooked, it's going to really look terrible, a piece of 16th tape, fine line tape, then I laid out what will be the yellow bar. Now, I'm not sure I want to make it that thick, thicker, or thinner yet, but what I did want to do, and this was critical, I want to include this little, the little, I guess they're landing lights, that would be the, the uh, navigational lights, in each wing tip. So I'm going to go, and now it, it starts to have a little bit of a curve, then it stops, and then there's that denotation for the light. So I want to include that in. And again, I want to, I want to try to space this up in such a way that when you look, you'll still see a little bit of a curve and that little indentation. I'm trying to get this proportion right, but the problem is this this is too thick now, so I'm going to reduce this by it. We'll just run another piece of eighth inch tape along, reduce it by an eighth, and then reduce the whole size of this by an eighth to get it more in proportion. It's the proportion I'm looking for. Notice this, see what I've done is add an eighth of an inch. By reducing it, I have a lot closer of a scale amount of curve, and the landing light gets more of a scale size. And I have, a, I have an idea I'm going to try on the landing light. I'm going to try to make it look like the glass representation of it. Maybe I'll just feather the edges in or something. But right now, I think I've got it. It's a 3 8 and a 16th on each side, working off the center line. Interesting to me. See how they used to cover the, the nozzle of the gun with what looks like a piece of rubber. And just watch this. This this was something that when I was doing the research for the Spitfire, I found they, they duct tape. It looks like plastic duct tape over the cannon holes, and it was usually red, I guess so people didn't stand in front of it. Just one of the things you can pick up off some of these great videos I got from England. Amazed that is I had the original outline, a sixteenth and a thickness of the tape, and of course that was it just looked too wide. Even though that worked for the Spitfire, but what I'm gonna do with this, and I've done this back and forth about five times, I'm gonna put the original tape on and then deduct the thickness of one tape, so it's actually, this is three-quarter inch tape, I'm glad I'm not a, open a house here. And when I put the next piece of tape on, that'll be a quarter inch less. I'm losing my hair, it's winding up in a tape. Anyway, a little detail like this and a little detail like those navigation lights, I think is going to be uh, a nice little addition to the plane. And the first piece sets the second piece. Now when I take this piece out, I have the exact stripe, and I'm referenced off the center line, so in essence it should be the same top and bottom. Now, believe me when I tell you, this this took longer than I'm willing to admit. 
but getting the proportion right is so, so important to just get it that it's not too thick, not too thin. Now, I'm really excited about the idea of including those navigation lights in because I have a little idea that I can do them with candy apple red and candy green Brodac. And what they'll have a little, I have an idea how to make them look a little three-dimensional, which I'll try to include, but I want to out, what I want to do right now, I want to get the yellow on, and then I can work on the fuselage, the striping. I'm, I'm really one day away from having this trim finished. I need to see how this is going to look once we shoot the yellow. Amazing that is, there's certain little jobs that if you get them wrong, or you get that too thick or too thin, it really looks out of scale. Getting it, because this isn't a scale model, everything has to be proportioned and fudged and well, that's where having a good set of plans really comes in. This is a lot of the things you can pick up off the video of the plans, save a lot of time if you're building a copy of the model. Alright, this has been drying up. It looks like it's really going to be the shape that I had really envisioned. Now we're going to have to wait till that dries. Next step here is going to be, I'm going to do those invasion stripes on the fuselage. The first thing I have to do is back mask all of the yellow and the roundels of my pattern. It's like a giant barber shop. Then I can lay these out in scale. I only have to back mask the white ones. So actually, what I really have to do is just back mask the yellow. I have to back mask this one and the roundel. This will get back masked so I can save some time that way. I need to do the Y and the roundel only. These will get back masked when I lay out the stripe. Very creative, Wendy. And it's hard to realize just how difficult it is to do this until you do it because as it goes around the fuselage, the lines don't want to match up. And without proper patterns, and, and I'm not sure we have proper patterns here, it takes a lot of fudging. Now what I usually do is when I'm done, I go and measure each bar because I've taken into account the thickness of the tape. Having a pattern is it absolutely mandatory if you want to get these straight, and we've referenced them at 90 degrees to the stab center line. The tricky part, and it's tricky. You can see how many times I've changed this. Right? It isn't only the thickness of the stripes on the flat parts of the fuselage. And of course, I have to account for the thickness of the tape. What happens is, as they go around the fuselage, they tend to get a little thicker or thinner. I see now that one's a little thin. We need to thicken that one up. And of course, when you have to do this, you have to adjust both sides of it, or else it starts to look wrong. And the most important thing is that right across the top of the fuselage, we have our black. And it takes a lot of shuffling and jingling around. You can see how many times I've moved the tape. But when it's done, if it's wrong, it really jumps right out at you. The last thing we're going to get done today, with the black invasion stripes painted. Boy, that was a lot of work. These were two jobs that just extremely labor and I can't believe how long this took to do. But when they're right, they really do. That really set, to me, it sets a model apart in a way that when there's 10 models, even similar models, and one has those big invasion stripes, it stands out in a crowd. Back is drying. Tomorrow we'll come back, figure out what we want to do with those landing lights. What I did is I took out some candy apple green. We're going to do a little, a little test to see if I can make something really fancy out of this. Anyway, the Brodac candy apple colors, what I'm going to try to do is feather and fog them in to give the look of glass. Again, I'll work on that tomorrow. Now today, the first thing I want to do is get off all this tin foil. This has really, really dried up nicely. I want to get all the tin foil off, and I guess the last little thing I need to do, and I'll do it as the first paint operation, I want to, I want to with the candy apple brodecto, paint in those little... Um, 
navigational lights. I think that'll add a nice dimension to this model. I've been thinking about that tonight, thinking how I want to do it. This looks like it came out real nice. And we are in another two-day window of nice weather. That's ready. Now I want to mask off these landing lights. Always do I press this up and try to make myself some kind of a pattern. So you can see the tape came through. The idea of this is to get as few joints as possible in it and still leave the landing the navigation light exposed. Each one of these, I know once I start working, I don't want to make make them opposite or wrong. But again, it's burdock, candy apple green, and candy apple red. The reason for the candy apple is pretty simple. It'll, it'll stand out as a totally different entity than if we just painted it Miss Ashley red or flat green. It'll have the look of a piece of glass because I'm going to fade it in. But these canopies were faded in. So it gets dark at the edge and almost silver in the middle. Gives it a three-dimensional look. We're going to try to do that on the landing lights. The thing with the Miss Ashley, the carbon canopy, is the almost black at the edge and almost silver in the center. Gives it a three-dimensional look. Okay, we're ready to paint. I want to start off it apart and then work my way in. And I just want to fade it in. I'll leave the exact center silver. I'll do the same thing from this side. Leaving that exact center silver. I fade something, start off it apart, get a feel for how the gun is spraying, and then work your way out onto the part. Low pressure usually helps get a nice fine spray. Again, I want to leave right in the center. I want to leave it silver. I just want to have the slightest little bit. And I'm going to take the black, the gun with the black, and just go right across the edge. Black. And I just want to get just the slightest little black. Get an idea how much it's spraying. Just the edge. Just give the edge the slightest bit. And now, before that actually dries, I want to put a coat of clear on it. Another handy thing about having all the paint in the guns ahead of time. Wet, a wet coat of clear. I want a dry coat of clear. I don't want it to... I want it to maintain or look like that three-dimensional look where the silver's in the very center. And it looks like we have it pretty close anyway. Now we'll do the other side in candy red brodac. Let that dry and then when we take it off we'll get a look at how it looks. See how close we've come to replicating that over at the end of this video. We're going to obviously put an ink line around this, clean this edge up once this dries. So far, I would say we're only a couple of days away from having this really look like the typhoon that we had imagined. 
think those landing navigation, I keep calling them landing lights, navigation lights are really going to really going to show up well in the final airplane. Anyway, I like to walk around it at the end of every day. We've made a lot of progress. The next step is going to be to mix up the camo paint. Mix up the color for the bottom. Touch up any little silver spots that may stay. I know there's one on a fuselage here I want to touch up. Little spot there I want to work on. Little spot on a trailing edge. Little things that need to be uh, made just a little bit better. And we will be ready to paint. I'm looking forward to it like nothing else. And I hope to see you on the next video. But I guess it's the single most exciting to me part of building a plane is getting these final colors on, which we're going to do on the next tape getting that overall look that we once had in our mind's eye and now is kind of a reality. It's coming up on being a reality anyway. And again, thanks for joining us and please share the tapes and please share the information that we've, we've all gathered together and through these videos try to share.